Hey folks, it's Joe. Last Friday, we released a special episode featuring the great Dennis Davis. Dennis played with everybody from David Bowie to Stevie Wonder, and he passed away last Thursday. So if you haven't heard it already, check out our tribute to Dennis. Coming up, my conversation with Mario Rubalcaba of Off and Earthless. But first, some reader emails. Hello from South Wales, UK. Just wanted to say how much I love the show. I think the drummer's existence is certainly a lonely one in many respects, and at this point in my life, I really feel the trap set is helping me approach dealing with my own problems. Being able to hear drummers communicate on a level that's not about gear and chops is exactly what I've been searching for. I find the sense of community hard to permeate where I am, and listening to guys like Mike Clark speak about his spiritual connection with drums and pretty much everyone else talking about their various crises makes me feel considerably less alone and perhaps even like a real-life drummer. Maybe. All the best, Tom. P.S. Put that logo on a t-shirt already and take my money for fuck's sake. Tom, as I've said before, uh, the trap set began as a thinly veiled way for me to address my own neuroses and uh, to figure out how other people navigate through life. So I'm really glad that you're finding it as useful as I have. Regarding t-shirts, those are going to happen sometime soon, and I think we're also going to go with some more exotic trap set merch, maybe trap set medallions or embroidery. What do you think? Hashtag fan mail. Hiya, Joe. I recently stumbled upon the trap set, I think Janet Weiss tweeted about the Portland episode, and have been voraciously listening through the archives. I'm coming back to drumming after a long hiatus, and the podcast has turned me on to at least a dozen drummers I hadn't previously been familiar with. It's just consistently entertaining and enlightening, and I felt compelled to tell you so, so thank you. I really appreciate that the show's accessible to everybody, but I also dig it when y'all get super drum nerdy. Some kind of gear nerd bonus nugget section on the website would be pretty great. And while I'm making unsolicited requests, my dream guests would be Georgia Hubley, Faye Milton, Mo Tucker, Jim Eno, Paul English, Andy Ramsey, Christopher Bear, and a Motorik special. Thanks again for all you do, Christy from Austin, Texas. Well, Christy, we've reached out to almost everybody on your list, although I don't have a way to reach out to Mo Tucker. So if anybody out there has Mo Tucker's email address or phone number, please pass it on. Also, it's a great idea to put up some nerdy drum talk as bonus episodes. We'll definitely do that in the future. And welcome back to the world of drumming. If anybody else has questions or suggestions, you can reach us at thetrapset at gmail.com. All right, let's do the show. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. Hearing Godspeed by Earthless, featuring my guest Mario Rubalcaba on drums. Though he was passionate about music from an early age, Mario began his professional life as a skateboarder, competing on a team formed by legendary skater Tony Alva. By the mid-90s, however, Mario made the leap to music as a member of several key San Diego bands, including Rocket from the Crypt, Clickatatic Itawi, 411, The Black Heart Procession, Pinback, and Hot Snakes. Mario shifts effortlessly between loose and precise. He's just as compelling laying down a hypnotic psychedelic groove as he is pushing a band at breakneck pace. He tours often in the punk supergroup Off and is currently recording an EP with his new band Alpine Fuzz Society. I interviewed Mario at his home in San Diego where he lives with his wife and his dog, Lemmy. And now my conversation with Mario Rubalcaba.
I always wanted to be a drummer. And then, um, then uh, for a short time, I wanted to be a, a BMXer. <laughs> and then, uh, and, but then. When uh, did you start skating? How old were you? Um, I, I always rode a skateboard when I was, you know, like seven years old. Cause my, uh, my one cool uncle, he was, um, that I learned a lot of music from. Um, he's kind of my mentor. And it's always about the cool uncle or older brother or cousin or something. Dude, right? My uncle was the coolest though. He was like a bitch and skateboarder surfer. He didn't play music, but he listened to good music. Um, so he was, uh, a really good skateboarder in the, in the seventies boom. So he would take me to, uh, you know, skate parks and I, he always had a board laying around and issues of a uh, skateboarder, you know, hanging around. So I, I just studied those magazines as a kid just cause they were cool. And I just skated in the driveway. I didn't really start skateboarding though too much to years later. Um, after my, uh, my bike got stolen mm. and, um, bikes were, much more expensive than a skateboard so um uh i got a skate uh just kind of a no-name skateboard uh complete and started going to the del mar skate ranch which was one of the only remaining skate parks at the time and from there uh so what was happening like there had been a boom and then interest was waning so the parks were closing down yeah skateboarding just died so it was huge from like 77 through you know 76 through like 79 80 it just really like died all the um all the concrete skate parks just uh closed down and got destroyed and uh there was only two of them really like in the country at least on the west coast it was upland and uh, del mar skate ranch mm -hmm. so um that was uh where i started kind of uh taking it you know doing it all the time what was the relationship between music and skating? <clears throat> um, like, how did those two things come together for you? Well, I was already into music. I was into, you know, it was a pretty big change in my life. I was into heavy metal, and um, in sixth grade was like, for fifth and sixth grade was when I got into, like, um, I used to listen to an L.A. station called KMET, and the DJ there, um, Jim So this Ladd. is like 83, 84. 82 83 yeah yeah and uh jim ladd was a dj he's still on like serious radio and um he uh, friday nights he would do a um a late night metal it was called metal shop and the stuff that he played he just changed he just effed up my whole world man because he like introduced me to motorhead uh all the first albums by venom uh slayer metallica uh we should mention what's your dog's name Oh, my dog's name is Lemmy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, so, uh, except all these, all these metal bands that I'd never heard that were, uh, much, much more heavier, much more faster, much more evil, like you name it. And it, it I was just like, oh my goodness. And then, um, uh, and then right about the time I started skateboarding, I would met a couple people that were into punk and early hardcore. And uh, I remember them laughing at me, like when I was like playing them like Venom or something. They're like, "You think that's fast?" I was just like, "Yeah, man, this kicks ass." They're like, "Check this out!" And they played like, <laughs> they played me Bad Brains, right? And then they played me like, uh, you know, a local band from here called Battalion of Saints. And I was just like, "It's Holy interesting shit. because I feel like back then, you know, way pre-internet." Music, musical taste was so much more of a social signifier as to like who you are that like there was that separation between people that were into punk rock and metal like it had to be like oh you yeah you had to choose or something <laughs> like, definitely or like pretend that you like hide your metal records right when you got into punk or well, something or hide your at, deep purple at records. shows I mean um, you know I started going to shows at the tail end of the uh, punk versus metal kind of you know. Um, rivalry and so if you were a, a, a metalhead guy going to punk shows you were gonna they were gonna let you know you weren't welcome what was your plan like what did you think you were gonna do with your life at that point well then that's when i wanted to be a, a skateboarder yeah so um i uh i didn't really wasn't playing drums too much at the time there was a few years where i'd kind of stopped playing and uh and i still had you know a kit and stuff like that but i just didn't play every day and um and I was just, you know, way into skateboarding and listening to music. I just wasn't playing it as much. And uh, 
And then, um, you know, a year or two in the skateboarding, um, some of my older friends, uh, they wanted to start a band. And um, he played guitar, and he was just, you know, like overheard him saying, like, I wish I knew someone that played drums. And I, you know, stepped up. I'm like, I can, I can play a little bit, you know, and had to wrestle up a kit, you know. And <laughs> but then the, my first band was like, I think I was 13, you know. And uh, I haven't, yeah, I haven't stopped playing drums since then, so. Were you a good kid? Were you a good student and like a good son and stuff? Or were you getting into mischief? Um, I wasn't horrible. I wasn't a saint, though, you know. Um, I did okay in school. Um, you know, I wasn't, I definitely wasn't on a path to uh, enlightenment, I would say. Uh, you know, I got in a little trouble throughout the years. Well, music is enlightenment, right? Yeah, and skating well, is that's too. what I was going to say is that I definitely, um, you know, I can say that like skateboarding saved my life for sure. Like, it well, what saved path my life. would it have gone down with, had it not been for skateboarding? Um, well, I can't, well, I can't really say that, say what, that well, I would what does that be mean some exactly? gangbangers. I mean, yeah. but like I was surrounded by that. And, you know, I didn't grow up in okay. the worst neighborhood. I didn't grow up in the best neighborhood. And everyone I went to school with was definitely like, you know, they just turned, it was like kind of a cholo, you know, sort of a vibe and, um, you know, and then going, getting into high school, uh, a lot of people that I grew up with, you know, from a long time, they just got into drugs and partying. And, uh, you know, a lot of my family was like, my cousins around my age, you know, were just, just in a super partying, you know, like just doing drugs and stuff like that. And for me, it was all about skateboarding and music. Mm -hmm. And that was like, you know, my whole like, like retreat from all that stuff, you know? This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. Who mentored you in the skating world? Um, I would say, actually, uh, my, first, uh, my first band, um, his name is Mark Hostetter. He was a guitar player in it, and um, he was also a skateboarder as well. Um, he definitely... Uh, I would say um, I took me under his wing. You know, he was a couple years older than I was back then. And when you're 13, that's a pretty big deal. You know, you're hanging yeah. with a 16-year-old who's driving yeah. you everywhere. It makes a huge difference. Totally. So, you know, he took me to shows. He uh, took me to all sorts of skate contests. You know, we like, I mean, we were in our first band together. So definitely I learned a lot from him. You know, his parents um, bought me my first real my first brand new drum kit you know what i mean and uh and man it was a my whole dream as a kid was to have a, a double bass kick or you know kick drum you you're know you're still like, holding on to the kiss thing totally <laughs> so you know all these years as a kid i was just like imagining like man two kick drums this like three rack toms this whole like like neil pert kind of pert thing and and i got it you know we went to guitar center and we bought a brand new your Pearl friend's parents kit. did it for you yeah and the kit was like it was like over two grand even back then what did the parents do um were they, they were in the wealthy? skateboard industry oh okay and so um you know uh they yeah they were in the skateboard industry and, and stuff like that and you know and um so but they that's really cool. They, they were really supportive of, of what he would do with skateboarding and music. They're like, yeah, we want to do this band. So like, yeah, okay. Well, the deal was, you know, I had to uh, pay them off and, uh, you know, month, a monthly payment and stuff. So I were you working my ass at the time? Off. Not a real job, but I did, you know, I, um, I was skateboarding. I was, I just got sponsored by uh, Alva at the time and he wrote for Alva too. So uh, I think our, our plan was that, the day that I would turn pro, maybe in a year or two, you know, I would, I would, you know, pay them off with a little bit of money back then. And so stuff. did that happen? Yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah. So you went pro like a year later? But maybe two years later when I was like uh, 17, almost 18. What did that mean to you at the time? Oh, man, it was everything. It was like the dream. But... <laughs> so what does that mean? The okay. dream came down and it smashed everywhere because skating died in 1990. <laughs> so well, now it's back, right? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's got a different context in society than it used totally. to. Totally, it's not yeah, like it's, an underground movement. It's not much. as outlaw, and but it's just there's parks everywhere now, and and dads back like the '70s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dads do it with their kids now, and that's great. I mean, I'm glad I'm still able to kind of uh, still physically do it. You so know? tell me what what does it mean? Like, what did it mean at the time to be a pro skater? What did you do? What were your obligations, and uh, uh, how did the money come in? Uh, my, my job, um, was to enter contests. Uh, we tour around and go do demos, you know? Um, and, uh, a lot of times there would be distributors from, you know, other countries that would want to fly in some of the team and do demos there. But, uh, basically just, and also it wasn't as reliant as like filming video parts back then. And, kind of that kind of stuff um but yeah mostly contests and doing demos and just uh kind of keep them up on your game you know is it something that came easy to you um well skate i can't say skateboarding came easy um i've definitely uh broken myself over it <laughs> you know um but uh i, th I think that yeah, skateboarding was a lot of work um but i feel that once i after uh I learned how the basics of it, um, then I kind of just had my thing, you know, and I could do how I wanted to do it. Um, was drumming more natural or about the same? I think I would say drumming is, is just comes very natural. Okay. Um, because I've just, I don't know. I can't really say, well, that's what you, you were saying. Your mom even told you you were doing yeah, it. Yeah. It's just, um, that's what I feel I'm here to do. Yeah. That's, that's what I do best, you know? I've had I've had many jobs over the years, uh, you know, in this and that. But I I think what are this some is of your other jobs? Um, I used to, let's see. Well, my first job was a I was a prep cook at a, at a vegetarian restaurant here in Hillcrest, though from like in the nineties. And I never <laughs> why they why they handed me a knife and said start <laughs> start chopping these vegetables. I don't know, but I'm glad I did it because it, it uh, was actually a pretty fun thing to do and learn. Knife skills are mm -hmm. the most important skills. Yeah, like I still have my cooking, knife, man. You got it. <laughs> so do you cook a lot? Um, I'm trying okay. more and more, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And over the years, you've been in so many bands at this point. What is it about your <clears throat> style and your approach, do you think, that is so adaptable or that people gravitate towards? I just really try to um, play for the song or for the music that um, that's being kind of thrown at me, you know? Like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example for... Well, something at the time that was really, really different for me was a, a band called the Black Heart Procession. Mm -hmm. And um, before that, I I was playing in a in a kind of a art punk hardcore band called Click Attack Guitar. I remember that too. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, after Click Attack broke up, um, I joined in with a uh, Rob Crow in a project called Thingy, mm -hmm. and that was that was essentially a pop you know, pop rock music band, like songs were really poppy, but um, it was also some of the more technical kind of drumming stuff I've ha ever had to play, you know, and it wasn't, and it was different from Click Attack where it was like, still the drumming was like all kind of crazy and stuff, but like Rob's songs were so precise and so like these parts are these parts and there mm -hmm. was no room for like this kind of looseness that Click Attack had, like whereas that band just jammed to form the songs. You know, Rob's was just like a very like I have this song and it's thirty seconds long and you know right here, let's let's freak out and here's that you know or something, so that was new to me back then, and then uh, then when I met you know met up with Paul and Toby, um, listening to the what they had it was all just piano and you know saw and some little bit of guitar and very laid back vibe, and um, uh, to me I just thought you know you know they just threw at me like hey there's a few songs that could use some drums let's kind of just roll through these three why do people always think of you though 
Um, well, I don't think that was... Like, is I'm it not, something about your personality also that makes it easy for you to work with? Um, Why know. are you the I shit? Think, Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just our circle of friends maybe yeah. at the time, you know? Like, uh, because, uh, I mean, there's lots of good drummers, but like... San Diego is a relatively small scene, but there were lots of bands happening, yeah. like, especially in the 90s yeah. coming out of that scene. Yeah, I just think our circle of friends just kind of uh, happened to be, you know, and mixed up and there's a lot of different little characters but i mean maybe i i mean i'd like to think i play different from other people but um yeah i just think we getting along with people is a big part of it you know and um if you're known as a tough person to work with you know i i don't think anyone wants to work with anyone that's kind of like you don't vibe with you know so I've been lucky to get along with these people really well and before playing music with them and just happen to be on a same wavelength to be able to play music with them and do you still get the same kind of high that you got when you first started playing music yeah definitely yeah um and i love playing live uh, i love touring for the fact that i get to play live and you know and and that people will actually you know shell out some hard earned cash to see any of my bands you know or bands that i play with um i'm I'm honored. I'm grateful, man. Like, it's not. It's it's tough to do it, man. It's not. It's not an easy thing to do, right. you know. Um, do you like being on the road as much as you did when you were a kid? Um, I, I, I yes and no. I mean, it's a different thing now. I mean, um, it's a little bit different when you have a family and you know I have a daughter and you know wife and stuff. So uh, definitely, I don't. I don't like being away from home a long time. But I do have fun on the road. I mean, I like I like seeing new places, and um, I don't hate traveling. But it's it's you know it's kind of what you make of it too. You know, if you want to be bored out of your mind, you can be bored. You know what I mean? And you just what do gotta, you do when you're driving <laughs> from place to place? Just read and listen to music. Uh, you know, nothing too crazy. I'm not trying to learn like the learn a new you language know, physics of you know <laughs> trigonometry or something. But uh, you know, I just keep busy. You, you know play play the computer a little bit try to like make some music on that and just you know that kind of stuff nothing crazy we were talking about how much different things are now that cell phones are ubiquitous like as far as touring is concerned yeah like yeah you can always have something to distract yourself for yeah. better or worse <laughs> yeah yeah and and, and I mean, staying in touch with your daughter is probably so much easier too for sure man yeah definitely i mean I was just talking about that with someone else too that because i've still i mean i've done some touring pre-cell phone era you know what i mean yeah we're like me too like we had maps we you know you'd pull you had over to think and, more yeah you'd, you'd have to pull over and find that pay phone. you know that pay phone that worked yes. and <laughs> yeah i don't know i'm i may be romanticizing <clears throat> it a little bit because i was also younger when that was happening but it yeah. felt like more of an adventure oh it was for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> Today's episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Keplinger Drums. Since the 70s, Greg Keplinger has distinguished himself as an innovator, handcrafting one-of-a-kind snare drums out of stainless steel, copper, brass, and black iron. Greg's stylistically versatile drums have been played by everyone from Elvin Jones to Matt Cameron. You can check out keplingerdrums.com for more information or visit his Instagram page to see examples of his work. Let's talk about a couple of the projects that you have going on right now. Yeah. So Earthless, mm -hmm. that band has been going for a while now, but it's kind of like an off and on type situation. Yeah. What is the band doing right now? Um, we've been pretty active for the last couple of years. Um, the last few years since I joined Off, um, Off has been a band that's just been working nonstop for um, you know almost the last five years. Um, that definitely took up a lot of my schedule. And Isaiah, our guitar player, he um, had a couple other bands he was playing in as well. So, it, and he lives up in uh, Northern California. So um, there was a maybe a year or two where our schedules just didn't connect. Mm -hmm. But um, I kind of made it a 
a personal um, goal to to per, put Earthless a little bit, you know, higher on the on the list of, of priorities of music to to make and um, and but you know there's compromise that has to be made with with a lot of things and but it's been happening man i'm stoked it's really one of my uh, more special things you know that feels good to play on do you feel like the band is evolving creatively yeah i don't i don't know what direction but um but yeah every time i play with those guys man i always feel it's it's such a unique chemistry that we have and i'm really really thankful for it that uh you know, we've been able to play this long and you know um yeah, it's a trip. <laughs> we still have a lot of fun. We've had a couple projects come up where we um, had to come up with some stuff in the studio pretty quickly, and uh, we were able to do that. And it do you was like working of, faster in the studio or slower if you have the choice? Um, I guess if I, I would, I would like it that there wasn't um, such a, a deadline per se. But at the same time, that might just make you be a little bit less motivated to really get the job done. I can't get anything done unless I know I only have a certain amount of time yeah. to finish it. Otherwise, so, I like, get lost. Um, I'm pretty used to working under pressure Yeah, and stuff. So that's how a lot of the off recordings have been. We were, we're like, man, we got to get this done in like a week or something, you know, and like literally like learning the songs in a two week time period and then going and recording and then just bam. So you say learning the songs. So who's writing the songs? Um, with off, uh, up until now, it's always been Dimitri and Keith. Okay. And they, you know, they'll write the songs together and then come, we'll, uh, well, me and Steven will meet up we'll, at the, at the band room and, uh, just go over all the, the riffs and stuff. And then we kind of contribute from there, you know, how did that band start? Oh, that's a trip, man. Um, you grew up listening to Keith. Yeah. In circle jerks and black flag and whatnot. Uh. Here's Lemmy. Hey, no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely grew up listening to Keith as a kid, and uh, so yeah. So what happened? Weird. How did the, how did it get started? Well, it, there's more of a story because uh, when I joined, when I started playing with Rocket from the Crypt, um, he before that, yeah, yeah, okay, he came out to a show in LA that we played on, so I met him there. And then um, on that same tour, I had met Dimitri, a guitar player, because uh, his band Burning Brides opened up for a couple of shows with Rocket. So I'd met both of those guys separately, you know, in uh, 2001. Um, then the following year, I filled in on a couple of shows for Burning Brides um, through that connection of meeting a year previously. So I had a little bit of playing history with Dimitri for about two or three shows. Um, and then fast forward to 2009 or whatever, um, Dimitri, Dimitri was going to originally produce a Circle Jerks record and that didn't work out for some reason. Um, and then, uh, it was kind of a little bit of a drama scene, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, he got fired as a producer. Um, but then, uh, Keith wanted to really kind of hold on to these ideas that he had, which were some what is off kind of essentially so they um they kind of had steven and i on this list of people they wanted to play with and uh we just happened to get in the room together was there a special chemistry that happened when you guys first started playing together yeah definitely man it was um it was pretty immediate you know like uh trying to think of what uh, i can't remember exactly the first song we played but it was um it was happening you know and definitely throughout the next practice or whatever, everything, all the songs just came together really fast. And um, there's a there's a cool energy in that band. I mean, there's a, a lot of uh, different personalities, but it kind of makes the music what it is, you know. I think so. The Trap Set will always be available for free, but we rely on donations from our listeners. Please visit our website at thetrapset.net.
and click donate. Subscribe to our show on iTunes. And if you enjoy what you hear, give us a review. How old's your daughter? She's nine. She's nine, okay. Yeah. So how did having a kid kind of change the way that you operated? Oh, man. It was, uh, at the time, I had no bands because uh, Rocket and Hot Snakes had just broke up the first times. And um, I had no, like, touring bands at the time. So I I got a job and, you know, I just had to, I had to find something, you know, to do. And what was so, your job? Um, I got a job. I've I've always worked in and out of the skateboard industry. Okay. So I got a job. Um, I was working in production and just doing like logistics and, you know, uh, I've done everything, you know, warehouse work, all that stuff. Do you like but, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And um, it's we're always working around good people and stuff. And it's in a world Making that, something? Yeah. Getting stuff made, you know, so... Yeah, I, I like that word a lot. So, What was your thinking at the time? Did you feel like it would be difficult to go back to touring as much as you had? Well, there was no touring. So um, there was a lot of times where I had to turn down tours just because I couldn't take the time off of work, you know. Um, I still played a lot of shows, you know, like like Earthless still played a lot of like local shows or we'd go to San Francisco, L.A. Um, and then kind of a little bit into it... Um, you know, we started getting more offers to do, like, just kind of fly in stuff or let's do this festival. Um, and then we got a really, a couple pretty cool tour offers um, with a Earthless did a tour at Baroness that was really good. And um, I was really lucky to work at a place that would um, let me go at times and, and be pretty understanding about it. But then it kind of came to a point, though, where... Um, you know, a lot of the music opportunities, they kept coming up and I had to really kind of decide, you know, like as to weigh it out, you know what I mean? And then uh, what eventually happened, um, I mean, and also having a, you know, my uh, daughter to, you know, have to pay for, a, you know, there's bills, real, just real life shit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so to to take that plunge into trying to do music full time and earn some type of a living to you know support your family that's that's a different ball game you know right <laughs> was it scary yeah well <laughs> i kind of got i mean uh a little bit later on i got uh i got laid off of my job a lot of people did um it was a company that went down to like from 100 people to less to less than half of that you know mm -hmm. so i was uh, once it, once my number was up you know i got laid off and i was just like shit like what and am you I had a do? kid at home yeah and uh so it was either start looking for another job but that but at that time off had just started and had some pretty good momentum going so um you know uh steven also at that same time he had just gotten laid off his job and so we just kind of at the same time we we're just like let's just go for this gotta make it work yeah so we went for it and you know um haven't worked uh my desk job in five years what is the audience like at an off show <laughs> um there's a lot of uh older people <laughs> older guys a lot of double xls um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah man you're not gonna really see a lot of uh girls in the front row at an off show um that's too bad though right <laughs> <laughs> no you know what does your daughter come see you play no, well, we don't really play locally too much. Okay. So uh, I can't say she has the She's never seen you play with Off? Not with Off, no. What does she listen to? Eh, she's, you know what? She's not a big music head like I am, but like she she appreciates just, you know, rock music, you know? She she likes Led Zeppelin and Rolling Stones and stuff like that. But um, yeah, she, she doesn't like jazz. Uh, she doesn't like hip hop or anything like that. But uh, yeah, she's... But she doesn't really listen to music, though, like how I did at her age. Mm -hmm. So, What's her thing? Her thing is she's really into uh, surfing. Cool. Yeah, So, and she's into uh, Can you surf? dance and stuff. A little bit, yeah. A little bit, okay. Yeah. I haven't done it in years, but I used to a lot. So, um, Yeah. <laughs> Do you dance? No. 
Well, I mean, I, you can, I, I okay, like to dance to James Brown. Yeah. You can skateboard and you can play drums. You should be able to dance, right? I have my own way of interpretive <laughs> dance. Let's say that. So. You dance to James Brown? Yeah. You do the mashed potatoes we, and everything? We could ask my wife. She, she thinks I can dance, but I think I'm horrible. Mario Rubicaba, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Yeah.